cessation strategies today with the help of Dr. Diaz. Um, so just to give a little perspective as to where we were and kind of where we're going and we're far away from where we were. These are some uh, now humorous ads from like the 30s and 40s and into the 50s about how basically doctors were um, advocating for smoking or trying the fresh, fresh cigarette and then they have little children buying cigarettes for their parents as gifts. <coughs> Just a quick little video to kind of hone in that that point that no, Dr. Diaz thought was funny. gives us a little perspective. I think that was like from the 1950s. <laughs> so little objectives for the lecture. I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of uh, smoking and uh, nicotine addiction. I'm going to go into different strategies, the non-pharmacological and pharmacological strategies, and review all the pertinent literature. So just a little background. I'm not going to, you know, put too much focus on this. I think we're all pretty well uh, understanding the fact that cigarette smoking is bad. Um, it's the leading cause of preventable disease and death in the U.S., and more than 400,000 people in the U.S. die prematurely due to smoking-related disease. It's a major cause of death from, obviously, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and pulmonary disease, and that's just touching the tip of the iceberg. So smoking-related disease is due to the exposure of the toxins in the tobacco smoke. The nicotine itself only plays somewhat of a minor role in this. Um, and tobacco addiction itself is not just nicotine addiction, even though that's what keeps people kind of coming back, but there's a whole social environmental factors, as we know, and conditioned behavior that goes along with uh, tobacco addiction. <coughs> so if you look at this little kind of slide, this uh, kind of reviews that uh, tobacco addiction, you smoke a tobacco product and there's a smoking behavior associated with it. Maybe people smoke a cigarette when they um, have their cup of coffee in the morning. And then the nicotine, you know, enters the body. Um, binds to the cholinergic receptors, and then there's a neurotransmitter release, most uh, notably dopamine, and there's reinforcement of this kind of behavior. So nicotine action, it, it's just uh, primary. It binds to the alpha-4, beta-2 nicotinic acetylcholine receptors um, in the brain. It's part of the mesolimbic uh, system. And then the thought is mostly dopamine, but other neurotransmitters are released and report in the patient has this positive uh, kind of euphoric almost reaction to it. And this is what's actually associated with a lot of, um, you know, addictive diseases. So just thinking very generally speaking, all the different neurotransmitters that can be associated with uh, nicotine, um, dopamine, what we talked about, what norepinephrine um, and GABA to, to name a few. So you get like a pleasurable response after and appetite suppression and kind of learning, learning and memory enhancement, kind of this mood modulation so people feel less anxious and um, less depressed and it, it leads to this rewarding effect that keeps people kind of coming back for more. So nicotine withdrawal, which we um, see in all of our patients who stop smoking, it um, usually is the worst in the, in the first three to four days after stopping smoking um, and then dwindles <coughs> of the next three to four weeks. So often when people stop smoking, they have this depressed mood, anxiety, they're, they're irritable, they can't sleep, they have difficulty concentrating, and then they have increased appetite and weight gain. So obviously all these negative effects which people then want to go back to smoking. So some of the barriers to quitting is obviously the nicotine withdrawal and the nicotine addiction associated with that. Um, but also patients will come in and say they feel like they've tried everything, and when realistically most people really haven't. Um, also, what I mentioned, environmental triggers, which is a part of the whole addiction, not just the nicotine part, where people, you know, light up with their morning coffee or at the end of a meal or while they're out drinking. So it's this conditioned association with the pleasurable effects of, of uh, nicotine. 
that makes it even harder to quit. So non-pharmacological therapy um, is centered around counseling, um, behavioral interventions, and physician advice. There's several different um, resources out there for patients, including quit lines, uh, self-help, you know, online um, resources, even phone apps these days, text messaging services, so there's a lot out there. Um, some other things that are fall into the non-pharmacological uh, category would be acupuncture, acupressure, laser therapy, and electrostimulation. <coughs> so starting out with physician advice where we can really kind of make the biggest difference, I feel like at least initially with our patients, um, there's a uh, review from 1995 of 188 uh, randomized controlled trials that showed just advice, simple brief encouragement provided by a physician at just a routine office visit could lead to an increased rate of 2% um, quit at one year. So that seems like a small amount, but it's, it's something. Um, then looking at a Cochrane review from 2013, it noted that just the unassisted quit rate with just general population of smokers was about 2 to 3%. However, with brief advice, this would increase by about 1 to 3%. Um, <coughs> and this included 42 different trials with greater than 31,000 smokers. And they found that there was really only a small added uh, benefit for more intense intervention in the office setting from the physician. So we can pretty much double someone's um, quit rate just by giving brief interaction in the office. And the proposed mechanism model that um, is supported in all the guidelines is the five A's model. I'm sure you guys have all heard about it. It should only take half a minute or less in the office to just ask every single patient about their tobacco abuse um, and use. Then if they are a tobacco user, advise them to quit. Um, and then go on to assess their willingness to quit, quit, see if they're even ready to quit. And then assist them in their quit attempt and arrange for follow-up. So I found this uh, kind of an interesting study. It was a randomized controlled trial done on uh, 560 smokers, um, all aged greater than 35 years old in England. So they did an intervention where they, it was in an office setting um, where they brought people in and did, they were smokers and they did spirometry on them. They, the intervention group, um, they calculated, and I'll tell you how there's a little equation about what someone's lung age is based on their FEV1 and they gave a graphic to the patient and they explained to them um, that their lung age was this and what would be expected for someone who was a non-smoker. And then the control just got a letter in the mail with their FEV1 um, just as a raw figure with uh, no verbal results communicated with the physician. Both groups were advised to quit and offered referral to smoking cessation programs. Um, at 12 months, the quit rate was 13.6 versus 6.4 highlighted in this uh, little table here with the results with a p-value um, showing significance. So really, though also they did look at was worse lung age that make the patient more likely to quit and it didn't. But this is just kind of showing the graphics that they actually showed the patient. Um, and down below, below here you can see the calculation they used to calculate a proposed lung age. And they showed the patient where they were on the graph um, as a smoker and then where a normal kind of healthy person would have been. So moving on to um, <coughs> telephone counseling, which is another uh, form of kind of counseling through quit lines. Um, a Cochrane review in 2013 showed that proactive counseling, meaning that the uh, quit line, first the patient had to initiate contact and then they would actually be called back continue to be called back and follow up with the patient, aided um, smokers in quitting. They didn't really find an optimum number of calls, but there was uh, a trend towards a dose responsiveness, so more calls seemed to have better uh, quit, um, quit percentage, but they didn't really have a number that was the best. And just for kind of to tell your patients, I mean, we have Henry Ford quit, uh, Counseling Association, which I'll get into in a minute, but um, there is a 1-800 just quit now that anyone can call and it's just a free 1-800 number to help with telephone counseling. So we have our Henry Ford Smoking Cessation Program, which I'm sure you all are um, aware of, and you can just go right into EPIC as I've detailed here, just to type in smoking cessation, and you can put a referral through, and then the program will call the patient and continue to follow up with them. So it's all done over the phone. 
With health insurance? Oh, I, I thought it applied to anyone. I mean, I've used it for other people. So I'm not 100% sure on that. But it's a free, you know, like service. So even if, if this one wasn't an option, if they didn't have HAP, which I'm not, I'd have to clarify that. There are many, many quit lines out there like the one I just talked about. So if it, you know, when you leave the Henry Ford system or whatnot, there's other other programs out there. Then there's a website, uh, Henry Ford website with uh, some other, it's called Tobacco Free, some other little pointers, and it can you can sign up there for the program as well. So, <coughs> so moving on to mobile phone based interventions, most of them were text messaging based, um, and there were no published studies about smartphone apps. But I know that's probably kind of a question that comes up, you know, with all the technology these days. So they did show a long-term benefit. There were only five studies, but the individual studies didn't, they were kind of varied. So only three of the five, I think, didn't um, show a good outcome. So there's also this free program through National Cancer Institute called the Smoke Free Text Program. So I think um, smokers can just text to this number and then they get responses and it kind of follows up with them too, where the smoker doesn't have to make the first contact, but um, kind of sends them text messages that are encouraging to help them quit. So just to kind of go back to the phone app, even though there's no trials, if you just type into you know, the app store on your iPhone, you get almost 100 different apps out there. Most of them are free, some of them aren't. Um, and they range in how they work like <coughs> tremendously, but a lot of them will just have like a daily pop-up reminder about how much have you smoked today and, and you know, encouraging advice to try and quit and to track your smoking and your quit date and all that kind of stuff. So moving on to Still more technology-based, internet-based interventions. There was a Cochrane review in 2013 that included 28 studies with more than 45,000 smokers. And they thought that it, it showed that it may assist in quitting if the uh, programs were interactive and tailored to the individuals, but we still really need more research to make conclusions. So just another list of all other free websites that we could potentially tell our patients about because they're you know, backed by well-known um, societies such as the American Lung Association and the uh, National Cancer Institute and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And these have different, you know, suggestions for quit plans and just information for patients that, since there's so much out there, at least these ones we feel like would have good information for patients so we could direct them to these various websites. Um, and moving on to other alternative kind of therapies, there was a Cochrane review in 2014, which included 38 studies and approximately 5,000 smokers. Um, they looked at acupuncture, acupressure, laser therapy, and electrostimulation. They found that there's possibly a short-term benefit um, of our electrostimulation not effective at all. And really overall, we need better studies and there's kind of lack of evidence in general. Additionally, there were some other studies related to hypnosis. There was a review of 925 studies and showed no benefit, and then a Cochrane review in 2010, which also showed no benefit. Moving on to pharmacological therapy, which is the majority of this talk, um, the, the three FDA-approved uh, pharmacological treatments are nicotine replacement therapy, bupropion, and verenicline, ver um, which we also know as Chantex. So just starting with nicotine replacement therapy, these are the main different forms that are out there on the market, some over the counter and some by prescription. So we all know the patch, that's by prescription or over the counter. The main um, contraindications, cautions, and effect, uh, side effects are dealing with skin irritation, but also insomnia. Um, the dosage range from seven to 21. You typically start with four weeks and then you taper um, by week, just depending on what their initial dose started at a gum, which you can get over the counter only. Um, main issue with that is more like mouth soreness and if you have TMJ to look out for issues. Uh, there also is an inhaler that's uh, by prescription only. I can't say I've ever seen this or you know, thought about prescribing it. Um, the thought with this is with the, the inhaler and the nasal spray, the onset of action is a little bit quicker so people get that more immediate effect. Um, then going on to nasal spray, <coughs> Once again, a lot of the adverse effects are more of the nasal irritation and throat burn, and this is also by prescription only. And then there's a lozenger, which is over-the-counter only. 
So just uh, a point to look at, the patch is more of a long-term slow release, and these other four therapies are, are quicker acting. So moving on to nicotine replacement therapy and um, reviewing the pertinent literature, there's a 1991 uh, JAMA trial done. It was a two multi-center um, trial done on 935 smokers. It looked at six-month abstinence rates and found that there was 26% versus 12% um, with a significant difference versus placebo. So what they did is they uh, put someone on at six weeks for the full dose of a nicotine patch and then 12 weeks, at t or after the next six weeks, they uh, weaned them down, and then they followed up, um, continued through six months. So also, it decreased this, I mean, obviously it makes sense, but decreased the severity of nicotine withdrawal sim uh, symptoms, and it even did decrease the amount of cigarette smoking in the non-quitters, even though whether that's, you know, benefit. So a Cochrane review in 2012 did show that it increased the quit rate by 50 to 75 percent. This included 150 trials of greater than 50,000 smokers. Um, there was no difference between the different types of nicotine replacement therapy, so they just did monotherapy of nicotine replacement, um, looked at monotherapy in this uh, review. Um, but then, or well, when I state the 50 to 75 percent, that was just monotherapy, and there was no difference between them. But there was increased chance rate of quitting with the combination patch plus a faster-acting mode of nicotine replacement or with bupropion. Yeah. Um, so now moving on to other uh, pharmacotherapy, uh, the main ones being bupropion, renaclin, and then I'm going to talk touch on clonidine uh, nortriptyline, which are not FDA approved, but they're second line uh, therapy. So bupropion, which we all know is Zyban, um, you have to be cautious with the history of seizures in these patients, which we all know. Um, adverse effects were mostly associated with insomnia and dry mouth. The dosage is 150. Um, for three days, once a day, and then you titrate up to uh, twice a day. You can use this also in maintenance therapy. So after the patients quit, if there's uh, initial, um, you know, the person continues to quit and you, you feel like it was successful, then you can continue that on maintenance therapy. This is al also only available by prescription. Um, moving on to Renaclin, which we all know is Chantex. You have to be cautious in people who have uh, renal disease. You have to dose reduce them if their um, creatinine clearance is less than 30. I think it goes to just once daily. I think it's actually 0.5 once daily in that case. But you end up titrating people up to one milligram BID. The main side effects with this are nausea, a lot of GI kind of side effects, and then abnormal and vivid dreams, which we've all heard patients complain about. And this is also prescription only. Clonidine's also been looked at, as well as nortriptyline. I'm not going to focus on these, but I'm going to talk about them a little bit later. Um, but clonidine, there's, you know, dose-related side effects that's of concern. This is also prescription only. Uh, nortriptyline um, was looked at. There's risk for arrhythmias, and there's a lot of other side effects to sedation and dry mouth, but it has been found to be effective. <coughs> so starting with bupropion, um, it's a dopamine norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. That's the thought as to why it works. Um, in tobacco cessation. So it was originally marketed and is still used as an antidepressant. So a lot of times you try to prescribe this to your patients and they're like, well, I looked it up, it's I'm not depressed, it's, you know, whatnot. But you can assure patients that it's really not just for people who are depressed, it works in people who aren't depressed as well. Although it's not a bad idea to maybe put them on that if they also have depression. Um, like I said, it's marketed as uh, Zyban for smoking cessation, but it's also on the market for depression um, as well, Butrin. So the proposed mechanism of action, like I touched on, is a dopamine norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, and it has, it has different effects in the area of the brain. So it basically attenuates the stimulant effects of the nicotine is what they think, um, to then kind of give them that, that uh, positive reward um, and doesn't deplete the, the dopamine. So it's metabolized in the liver and excreted by the kidneys. It's half-life about 21 hours. That's um, why we dose it the way we do. It is a CYP450 inhibitor, so you have to look into that when you're looking at people's current drugs they're on to. Um, and it works off active metabolites. So for bupropion for smoking cessation, there was a trial done in the New England Journal 
1997, which included 615 smokers at three different sites in the U.S. They were divided into people getting uh, bupropion at 50 BID, um, people getting bupropion at 150 daily, um, people getting bupropion at 150 BID, and then placebo. And then as you can see just on this graph, basically that uh, the top line here is the, the dose we currently use, 300 uh, daily, so 150 BID. Um, and you can see their quick quit great after um, six weeks. This is after the targeted quit date is quite a bit higher and was significantly significant. Um, moving more on to this, just another graph from the same uh, trial, just a little table showing not only the six week, the previous one just showed the six weeks, but this shows up to 12 weeks too. There's 23% versus 12% in the placebo at the 150 BID dosing. Um, uh, and it also showed less weight gain, which is also something that people you know, will say, well, I don't want to stop smoking because I'm going to gain weight. So people on bupropion didn't have as much weight gain either. Moving on to Renaclin, which we know is Chantex. That's how it's marketed. Um, it's a partial agonist of the alpha-4 beta-2 nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. If you remember when I was talking about um, activity in the brain, that's where nicotine um, uh, binds to. So there's this proposal that there's this neuropsych psychiatric side effects, depression, and suicidality associated with uh, Chantex. However, they're really only anecdotally, even though they are listed under potential side effects and as a black, black box warning. Um, but really none of the trials have shown an, an increased incidence in this. Um, and the, one of the proposed thoughts as to why it has a sort of anecdotal um, stories about causing depression and all these things um, is just smoking cessation in itself is associated with mood disturbances because of the nicotine withdrawal that we talked about. And there's this question of cardiovascular risk which also hasn't been really validated in the literature. So mechanism of action, like I talked about, um, it's a partial agonist at the alpha uh, four beta two nicotinic uh, receptor. So there's partial stimulation while at the same time competitively inhibiting um, nicotine binding. So you get like a positive, you get the nicotine withdrawal symptoms are relieved by the partial stimulation, but at the same time, you don't get the rewarding effects of the cigarettes. They're diminished because of the receptor blockade. So a trial um, of comparing vericlinolin and um, bupropion in 2006, published in JAMA, included about 1,000 smokers. It was at 19 different U.S. centers, randomized controlled. Um, it uh, divided people into vericlinolin group, bupropion, and placebo for 12 weeks. And it showed that vericlinolin was more effective than placebo at all time points. So at all time points, Varenicline was more effective than placebo, and then varenicline was more effective than bupropion at 12 weeks and at 24 weeks with statistical significance. So varenicline was also looked at um, efficacy for maintenance therapy. So after someone's quit, you know, how long can you continue it and does it help people continue to stay quit? So. Uh, this was also published in JAMA in 2006. It started with about almost 2,000 smokers, and so it was like a parallel study, and they found there were about 1,200 uh, smokers at the end of 12 weeks that had quit. So they took those smokers and then randomized them um, and found that 70% versus 49% placebo were still quit at the weeks 13 through 24. So that's why they, there's an indication that you can use it um, for up to six months. So another kind of study that was done based on bupropion being used in as or is an antidepressant, people were wondering if um, how varenicline would be used in depressed smokers. So they took people who were stably treated or and were currently or past depressed um, in 2013. It was a, about 500 different smokers at 38 different centers in eight different countries. And it basically just showed it significantly improved rates of smoking cessation without any adverse psychiatric effects. Um, so you can feel sure that you can use it in depressed smokers. They did 
eliminate uh, people who were like on mood stabilizers um, and had other kind of mood disorders other than just depression and weren't stable with their depression. So now moving into combination therapy, which is kind of where everything's going. Um, I'm going to look at bupropion plus nicotine, varenicline plus nicotine, and then bupropion plus uh, varenicline. So starting with bupropion plus uh, nicotine patch, there was a trial in the New England Journal in 1999, which included almost 900 smokers. Um, <coughs> they randomized people to bupropion plus nicotine patch, nicotine patch alone, bupropion, and then um, placebo. So they found basically that bupropion alone or with a nicotine patch was significantly higher rate than the patch alone or placebo. Um, the actual percentages of people quit at 12 months, there were about 35% who were, on, were in the bupropion plus nicotine patch group and about 30% just on the bupropion group. There was no statistical difference between those two groups, however, but then comparing this to the people just on the nicotine patch, only about 16% um, were quit at 12 months, and then the placebo was like 15%. So there was a very, very small difference, just the nicotine patch and placebo in this trial. So moving on to varenicline and nicotine patch, there was this uh, New England Journal trial published in uh, 2014, um, which included about 440 smokers in South Africa. So it found that there was added efficacy. And, um, well, the, the thought too is how does this make sense with the way varenicline works and nicotine? Um, so they both target, target the alpha-4, beta-2 nicotine receptors. And so they thought, well, maybe it works because neither fully saturate the receptors or the nicotine actually binds to some other receptors that have different effects. But the actual, if you think about it physiologically, why would this help? You're giving them nicotine which, and you're blocking those receptors, but that was kind of the thought is maybe why it might help. And as you can see here, um, <coughs> the different quit rates, there was statistical si significance at 12 weeks and 24 weeks. Um, and you can see the percentages of uh, quit rate with varenicline plus nicotine patch were like 45% versus 30%, so not a huge percent difference, but it was found to be significant, and then at 24 reads was 32 versus 19 percent. So moving on to this kind of question is, can you use, you know, bupropion plus uh, varenicline? So there was a trial done in 2014 um, in the American Journal of Psychiatric, or Psychiatry. Um, it was randomized control, about 200 smokers who had failed to show reduction of greater than 50 percent smoking after one week of just the nicotine patch. So then they took these people that had this perceived di more difficult ability to quit smoking and then took them and put them either on varenicline plus bupropion or varenicline and a placebo. So their primary outcome, they were looking at continuous smoking abstinence at 8 to 11 weeks after their quit date. Um, so they found basically that the combination was efficacious in males. Um, people with high cigarette consumption and people with high nicotine dependence. And the way they defined that was high cigarette um, compensation, they said greater than or equal to 20 cigarettes per day, and then high nicotine dependence was based on this Fagerstrom um, scale, and it was a greater than five, which puts you in this moderate category of nicotine dependence. It looks at like when you have your first cigarette, is it less than 30 minutes when you wake up, and you know different things that, that are supposed to relate to nicotine dependence. So pretty significant if you look like it, just at the male versus the female, how you know many more people were quit, um, had quit smoking at this time point, and it didn't seem to really show the same thing in females. So I'm not really sure how to explain that, but if you have someone that's really having a hard time quitting, who's you know tried the nicotine patch and, and still can't quit, and they're very you know heavy smoker and they're male, then maybe it's something you would think about using. So other kind of pharmacological therapy that's out there that you should be at least familiar with is clonidine um, has been studied and shown that it hasn't really had statistical significance um, in a lot of the studies. People have quit more, but there hasn't been really a significance, and it's really limited by dose-dependent adverse effects, so it's really not recommended to use. Uh, nortriptyline, which is a tricyclic antidepressant, can be considered as a second-line agent. It's not FDA-approved. Um, but I wanted to just quickly mention it. 
an option. Some other things out there too are cytisine, which is a plant derivative and it's very similar to varenicline. It's not currently available in the U.S., but it is used in Eastern Europe and has been for many years and might be like a cheaper option, so it's something that might be coming in the future. And then SSRIs and you know, anxiety meds have been looked at too, just based on bupropion being an antidepressant and just seeing if maybe making people less depressed when they're withdrawing from nicotine helps and it hasn't been shown to be effective. So this is just a big, um, nice graph from 2008 um, clinical practice guidelines from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I just wanted to kind of bring your, your eye to Renaclean and um, the patch com and combination nicotine therapy and how they were basically the two groups that had the highest rate of smoking cessation. And this includes 8,700 papers and trials that they, they looked at and wrote the guidelines off of. So basically, and take home point is all mono and combo therapies are effective, but probably the most effective are varenicline and um, combination nicotine replacement. So just a basic summary of the pharmacological invention interventions. Once again, here's a little bit more updated than the 2008 guideline. Um, this is a Cochrane uh, review in 2013, which, in view, which took 12 Cochrane reviews of all the different studies, included 267 studies and over 100,000 smokers. And once again, basically found that you know nicotine replacement, bupropion, and brenicline all improved chances of quitting, and bupropion and single um, nicotine replacement were equally as effective as uh, monotherapy, but that varenicline was more effective than, and, than single uh, nicotine replacement. But then as I've highlighted down here in red, varenicline and combo um, nicotine replacement therapy are equally as effective. So those are really the kind of the best options. And I just want to kind of touch base on this as something sort of in the future being looked at, you know, is there possibly a nicotine vaccine? So the thought is there's, you know, anti-nicotine antibodies, it binds the nicotine in the bloodstream and then that cannot cross the blood brain barrier. So then theoretically it would block the rewarding effects of smoking and lead to cessation. So far there's been no efficacy demonstrated in clinical trials, but there's, it's still under development investigation. So that's maybe more to come there. And then of course I couldn't have this talk without touching on um, e-cigarettes, which are, you know, the rave right now. So they were first produced in China in about 2003. They entered the U.S. market a few years later. So the way they work is basically they, they're, they you know, a little, they have battery operated typically. Um, they heat nicotine solution and make a vapor. The problem is they also contain other chemicals, which we don't really know exactly what's in there. Some even um, have been found to have formaldehyde in them, which is a known carcinogen. So most of them at least contain propylene glycol, which is usually the carrying solution, and glycerin, and then flavoring. Um, but we don't really know because they're unregulated, so we can't really make a good, you know, give good advice to patients. I mean, yes, in theory, if we just have nicotine and there isn't all the other toxins that are in cigarettes, then it should be, quote unquote, mm -hmm. safer. And if they're actually used to help people quit, then maybe it would be a good option. But right now they're unregulated, so we have no idea what kind of toxic chemicals could be in them. But of course, there's been some studies regarding them. Um, in 2013, there was a study published in Lancet, which included <coughs> 650 different smokers in New Zealand, and it compared e-cigarette to, to uh, nicotine patch. And it found a very small difference in the six-month cessation rate, but there was no statistical significance, so we can't really say that they're that helpful. Um, and I think the big issue that comes to mind is they're used, it seems very commonly, not for purposes other than quitting. So people don't start using the e-cigarette because they want to quit, at least a lot of the patients I've seen and what's kind of reported in the literature. People feel that they're just a safer option than traditional cigarettes, and that's what's kind of the companies are, you know, trying to propagate and tell people because they don't necessarily have the toxic chemicals that we know are carcinogenic it, that are in cigarettes, but we don't know what are in them because they aren't regulated. And then also it's used a lot where um, smoking is prohibited. So now there's all these bans on smoking everywhere, so people think, well, I can use my e-cigarette, you know, in the bar or wherever. So it's kind of not promoting the right purposes. Um, this use has just grown exponentially in the recent years. And another point of concern that actually exceeded, e-cigarette use exceeded smoking in young people. 
but people now, like teenagers nowadays, just start right with an e-cigarette and don't even start normal cigarettes. But that was kind of interesting. Um, and just kind of coming full circle, now these are the ads that are out there with e-cigarettes and some way look a little bit similar to, um, yeah, to the previous ads from like the 1940s and 50s. So now we got Jenny McCarthy here promoting e-cigarettes and telling no one to get vaccinated. Interesting. <laughs> it's like here, kid, you can have a cigarette, e cigarette, but don't have a vaccine. Um, and there's a very, there's a, I almost put a video in here with an ad with her that's pretty ridiculous where she's smoking e cigarette in a club and talking about it, but I refrain. Um, so, kind of just the main take home points is simple fish physician advice, even though it's not a huge difference, can make a difference in the office. And you should, it's recommended to use the five A's model approach. There's many, many, many resources out there for counseling, quit lines, self-help, but we can help our patients by at least getting them in contact with the ones that we know are backed and helpful. Um, and then in general, combination counseling and pharmacological is really the best, so taking it from two aspects, since we know it's not just a chemical dependence and it's, there's a lot of behavior associated with it. And then the three FDA approved um, drugs, once again, are nicotine replacement therapy, bupropion, and varenicline. And when using nicotine, if you're gonna like see someone off and say, fine, here's a nicotine patch, you really should be counseling them. They should, in addition to the patch, have a faster acting nicotine <coughs> mechanism, you know, like a gum or a lozenge so that they can get over the counter for those. Go ahead. That was just like a week ago? No, probably not. <laughs> anyway. Give whatever you want. I mean, yeah, they said patch combination with Chantex has been found. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, really? Well, that was like 2013, though. So, yeah, so leading up, like 2008, the guidelines looking at all the different therapies, and 2013, there was a Cochrane review that I reviewed that basically found that combination therapy, so patch plus like a gum or a lozenge, was pretty much the same as Chantex, but that Chantex versus monotherapy was better. So maybe the new one says, so even monotherapy is better. Okay, yeah, no, I didn't. Or the same. Yeah. No, and they, in fact, they recommend not to scare people and just and not necessarily be lectury, but just I found just if it's brought up and in the office setting, and most patients know that smoking is bad for you, but if you bring it up and advise them to quit it, it's just you show increased quit rates. So. Yeah. I mean, I, personally, I, I scare people, but... <laughs>
interventions, no matter what they are, also involve constant contact, phone mm-hmm. there's some kind of psychological intervention in most every study. So, you know, when you take out just the intervention without any methodics at all, just the contact of the patient, mm-hmm. the margin of these disease becomes even tinier. So my thing is why this crap just waste of time. You scare the crap out of the patient. <laughs> uh, show, you show them the point function test, let them know you have the lung function, they smoke away after lungs. If you don't make a cry, you're not going to be very successful. Well, not yet, but you spoke to them. They were like, what is that? I just lay out, and I'm, I don't say, oh, gee, John, oh, you poor guy. I'm so sorry for you. You must really stop smoking. I just, you know, that's what the family docs do. Uh, you know, I, I just lay it on hard and heavy. Yeah, something I didn't mention, which Dr. Morse brings up is all these studies pretty much included the behavioral aspect of it too. Actually, the, the literature I reviewed didn't show that it had to be that long, and actually more intensive didn't make a huge difference. So just bringing it up in the office and hitting on those points and just assessing it in every patient was shown to be effective. So it doesn't even have to, it doesn't have to be that long. But the big thing is to follow up with that, which Dr. Morris pointed out. And so sometimes these smoke and cessation programs can help because I mean we're not as physicians going to call our patients every week and say you still not smoking. So these programs will follow up with the patient and call them and. You just bring it up at every appointment. Um. I think there's like lots of effect that you had on that. You did like like that in Taylor. You tell them, mm-hmm. listen, you can keep smoking if you want on this, but it's going to lose its effect. It's going to breathe like a duck right now and you feel like crap. You know, yeah, this is going to make you feel better. I know it's going to encourage you to keep smoking. But hey, once you know, start getting worse on this, we shop a lot now. You know, this is it. You want to breathe like a duck and you can't help it. So, you know, you throw all those factors in for you. You have to make the patient feel bad about what he's doing. I have two questions, Dr. Maya. One is, you know, and it was touched, it was touched on several aspects of the lung screening that we do for smokers now. <coughs> it seems uh, more of a positive reinforcement that, oh, since we're screening, we can continue smoking. Right? Mm-hmm. So, no, because there was a concern that since we do the low dose screening now for, you know, the high that it would 